Welcome to the Perspectives on Healthcare podcast, where members of the medical community from different roles, venues, and locations share their unique perspectives on quality healthcare, its future, and how to improve it. Now, from the Your Keynote Speaker Studio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Rob Oliver. Thank you, and welcome to another Perspectives on Healthcare podcast. My guest today is Dana Coles. He is a member of Generation X. He is an emergency medicine physician down in Florida. Dana, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me. Oh, you bet. I'm glad to have you here, and I'll be very, uh, very interested to hear your perspective. So here we go. Tell me a little bit about yourself and your role in healthcare, please. Well, I've um, board certified in emergency medicine. I uh, was trained as an osteopathic physician. Uh, I've been working for 15 years now um, and uh, started around the uh, market in, in Syracuse, New York, where I did my residency training and then came down to Jacksonville, Florida. So I've worked in Jacksonville. I've worked in, um, in uh, the greater Orlando area afterwards, and that's where I am now. Okay. So I, as far as... Um, osteopathic doctors go. I, do you have any inclination as to like what the ratio is of um, osteopaths to you know more traditional MDs, I, or do you have any any knowledge about that at all? Well, I would say that it's uh, risen quite a bit in historical times. Um, they used to be in the far minority, and not so much anymore. Um, there's an equivalence in training. Uh, between the two practices. Uh, for me, I like the uh, philosophical difference in osteopathic medicine and really focusing on the holistic care where they uh, incorporate mind, body, and spirit all together. And the understanding that uh, one part of the body might affect others. Um, and that's what really drew me to the osteopathic principles. Um, the uh, teachings, though, have melded over time. And uh, this is once a foreign concept to a lot of medical practitioners has not been um, for quite a while now. Uh, and with a lot of the equivalence in training and a lot of equivalence in certification, uh, oftentimes you might have an osteopathic or an allopathic physician and not even know it. Got it. So practicing emergency medicine in the greater Orlando area, are there, I'm assuming that there, you know, you see things that are relatively typical. Are there things that are unique to that area that you're seeing in the emergency department? Well, we've had uh, quite a few different um, things that have happened. You know, uh, we have less uh, regional things than what I saw in New York. Um, so, you know, different things like Lyme disease isn't as prevalent, uh, things that, you um, you know, we might have a lot more uh, traumatic things, but different avenues. So I've worked in some places around Orlando that have had the knife and gun clubs. I've had some that were, um, you know, more trauma related, but a lot of, uh, you know, people think that if you're in an area where there's a lot of snow, uh, things like that, that you're going to have more trauma, let's, let's say, from car accidents. Um, but in actuality, people are going to be driving a lot more careful and they're going to be a little bit slower. Uh, so when you have things like uh, wide open roads and open lanes and stuff like that, now you get people that are doing 90 with the radio on real loud and, you know, <laughs> right. convertible top down. Sure. And I would imagine that you also have people who are less familiar with the roads because a lot of the, um, a lot of the folks that are there are transient coming in for vacation or something along those lines. I, what does quality healthcare mean to you? For me, the best quality in healthcare is uh, the relationships. Uh, the more relationship that somebody has with their patients, the better they're going to be able to conduct uh, a lot of the medical care. Um, there's pros and cons uh, for emergency practice style. Um, the one thing that doesn't happen as much is the patient relationships because they're generally very brief interactions. And a lot of times we have to uh, come up with answers to very problematic issues and we have to do it in a very uh, short time frame. And one of the things in emergency medicine that a lot of people might not understand is that 
uh, it's not just a problem in front of you. You know, there's also aspects of what are their social interactions? What are the social dilemmas? What are the contributors that are coming in, you know, for a lot of different aspects? Um, different things like uh, in recent years, looking for tattoos on teens or things that might indicate that there's human trafficking going on. Um, when all of a sudden uh, some people come into the emergency department with the exact same complaints. Um, you know, like, uh, let's say all of a sudden you have 10, 12 people show up with a headache that's uh, a little bit different than they've had before. Is that because you just had a gas leak in the local area that people weren't aware of? You know, so um, there's all these things that you have to pay attention to and understand. So um, the patient relationship uh, suffers for that, um, especially with the brief interactions. And, you know, I, I, I've become a little discouraged, I guess, lately that a lot of the primary care you know, has been uh, eroding, um, you know, where I think that's where primarily people can have those relationships and should, you know, to be able to provide the best health care for people. Okay. Uh, I, you've kind of done this already, but can you give me an example of quality health care? Um, yeah. If we have all factors uh, that are put together um, where you have a collaborative team effort uh, and, you know, people can, uh, utilize a lot of the interactions or relationships, like let's say from primary care, if we have communication and access to them, uh, if we can have the ability to um, minimize the amount of tests that have to be done uh, and lower the cost by actually getting back to histories, physical exams, and you know pertinent positives that are there so that people can understand the differences of what's happening today. Because a lot of those differences are are um, telltale of, of where you need to be looking. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is sometimes we have a bunch of new technology and a, a new testing that's available and um, we are quick to use that whereas there may be some, some old fashioned, so to speak, ways of examining the patient that could be a start that we wouldn't necessarily, that, the, the testing wouldn't be the first step. There would be some other steps that could be taken first. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Correct. And from our perspective, you know, in the emergency department, a lot of times people will use it as a convenience factor or they'll use it as a um, modality. Uh, one thing that discourages me is if healthcare costs come into it, you know, where they tell me I need to come in and get a certain study because it's actually going to cost me more uh, if I do it on an outpatient basis or it has to come out of pocket or, you know, these kind of things. It's a little disheartening because it should go the other way around. They should be getting a price break for, you know, doing it on their own and not not running to the emergency room to do it, so to speak. Yeah, I, I've mentioned this before, but it is very difficult and problematic to me as well that in healthcare when someone is prescribed a certain test or whether, you know, a certain piece of equipment, whatever it is, that the first question that's asked is what kind of insurance do they have? And in that way, their medical professional or their, their treatment team is not the one that's actually determining the course of treatment, but the, uh, you know, the treatment is determined by the type of insurance they have. But that's a side note. <laughs> uh, what do you wish people understood about your role in healthcare? Um, the number one thing that would be helpful for people to understand is how multifactorial it is. Um, and that, you know, there would need to be a factor of tolerance in that. Um, we try to utilize the services as quickly as we can and, you know, to be able to help people get their efficient care. Um, and while we're doing that, there's a lot of different factors that are going on. Um, so it is kind of a mental game, you know, when uh, there's things that are going on behind the scenes or maybe we're waiting uh, for tests to come back or we're uh, waiting to have a phone call that we put out on an urgent basis to come back. Or maybe something terrible has just happened, you know, um, where, uh, you know, you might have just run a code or pronounced somebody dead or, you know, had to facilitate some trauma or some social situation. And then you get to walk into the next room within a minute or two and you have to clear all that out of your system, start over and be able to have the new interaction. And that can make it difficult, you know, if, if the next person um, and everybody's focused on on 
their issue, their problem. We understand that. And uh, we want to make sure that we treat everybody the best and, and accordingly. Okay. Um, how do you, this is just curiosity for my part. How do you keep yourself from getting either jaded or like you talked about the importance of relationships and yet, you know, when you have people coming in, you're dealing with a lot of trauma. You're dealing with a lot of issues that, um, you know, if you invest heavily in the relationship, uh, it can be emotionally draining or, you know, just wipe you out from a, a psychological perspective. Can you comment on how do you kind of find that balance? My uh, personal outlook on that is to make sure that the expectations are in the right place. Um, and so it's a skill set that emergency providers have to develop. Uh, and it's probably one of the most difficult to develop. And if somebody asked someone who's been doing it for a couple of weeks versus somebody that has been doing it for years, I can tell you that it doesn't get any easier. Um, when uh, my outlook on it is uh, to be able to figure out what your um, e expectations are in the interactions. One of the things that people have said to me is, oh, you save lives for a living. I really don't. You know, sometimes you can't. Uh, sometimes it's inappropriate. Uh, what I look at it is we provide options and we provide options for people so that uh, they are able to do things that they wouldn't be able to do on their own fixes that they wouldn't necessarily have. Otherwise, um, patients are the ones that have to consent, you know, so I will lay out information for them, you know, and I will try to um, make sure that they're fully aware of the pros and cons of every side of the situation. And then they can make their consent of what needs to happen. And sometimes you'll tell people exactly, you know, what it is that needs to happen. And they'll tell you, no, they don't want it. Um, I've had a issue recently with a veteran, you know, and uh, he had one leg amputated. Uh, he was very disabled um, and he was living on the street. And we were able to uh, secure him a nursing home to go to uh, that would facilitate a lot of care for him, help him get his daily living activities done. And he told me not only no, but absolutely no, and started yelling at me in the process, you know. Um, so I think, you know, if you get into the perspective of, of having your expectations in the right place of what you're able to do for people, what you can offer to them, uh, and then you have to sort of disengage after that. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean you can't get invested in some of their stories, because even when there's the uh, low end stories where it might be emotionally impactful, there's also the high end stories and the high end stories, the people's achievements are the ones that, you know, really keep you coming back every day. And especially if you can facilitate it. I remember uh, back when I was trying to decide uh, what to do, um, you know, as far as a field. Uh, I was sitting and talking to someone, a man who um, his wife was dying, and uh, we talked long after my shift was over about life and death and the meaning of it all. And um, he came back in uh, probably four months later for an upper respiratory cold. And, you know, I was saying hello to him and nice to see him again. And he acted like he had never seen me before. He had no idea who I was. And in that same week, you know, this uh, woman came up to me in the grocery store. She says, oh, Dr. Coles, it's so great to see you. I haven't seen you in years. Do you remember when you ran in and you delivered my baby? You know, and uh, you were there when my OB uh, couldn't be there. And, you know, we uh, talked a little bit, but she remembered how many kids I had. She remembered exactly where I lived. She remembered everything about me. And I found that a stark con uh, contrast and, and then came to realize it was because I was there for one man's darkest day of his life that he wanted to just get rid of and he mm -hmm. didn't ever want to think about it again. Right. And I was also there for another woman's best day of her life and she wanted to remember every detail. And so I had to ask myself, you know, which, which part of that experience, human experience, do you want to be involved in on a day-to-day -day basis? And I realized I can't get people to stop smoking and I can't get people to eat properly. Um, but I can tell you, you're not going to die today. There, uh, well said. What excites you about the future of healthcare? I think one of the things that I saw over the last year, um, because the last two years obviously have been very difficult in the healthcare. Right. Um, but there was a massive collaboration, and I honestly believe that to fix our medical system, that's what needs to happen. 
there's no person that's going to fix it. No doctor is going to fix it. No politician is going to fix it. You know, it's going to have to be a collaboration among everybody. And what I saw is, again, we talked about, you know, would people put down a cigarette or would they eat differently? Um, but over the past two years now, people have put on masks and they've uh, worked together and they even put themselves in significant financial peril as they were isolating and locking down. And they did this for the betterment of themselves and for other people. Um, healthcare does its part, but it can only carry so far, you know, and the fact that everybody was able and willing to do that, you know, shows that this collaboration is absolutely possible. And one of the little known things, and I'll give a quick plug to an unsung hero is Dr. Bruce Rankin. You might want to have him on the show. Okay. When we talk about, uh, you know, if somebody's saving lives, uh, this is one of the guys who saved the world. You know, and he's a very unsung hero for doing it. Um, one of the things that uh, you may or may not know is we have one of the local testing sites for the vaccines. Uh, Excel Clinical Research is out in Deland here. And they were tasked in, in studying the vaccine, studying the effects and then the benefits. Now, what happens over time, um, you know, and people might say, well, it wasn't very well researched. We didn't research it for years like we used to. And the fact of the matter is, is that to develop a vaccine appropriately, you do a pilot study with like 3,000 people in it. And then you do a main study with 30,000 people in it. And it takes years to get 30,000 people together to study a vaccine that's an unproven for a virus that nobody cares about. Right. Nobody wants to run out and get the Zika virus vaccine, you know. Um, and this collaboration among people and healthcare, and there was five different companies and each of the companies got 60,000 volunteers. And they were able to process them just as quickly as they they could. You know, they were coming out of everywhere. And so D Dr. Rankin is uh, leading the Excel Clinical Research site. And that uh, that was able to process quite a number of these and get the um, vaccines out in record time. Yep, I will. I will definitely I'd love to have him on the show. Last question for you. What is one thing medical professionals can start doing today to improve the quality of healthcare? I think um, the main thing that they could do uh, across the realm is to have the understanding for people of the challenges that are out there um, as, in regards to finances, in regards to um, accessibility to care, uh, things like that. And, you know, to try to open up where we can uh, whether it be a small amount of off time. Um, one of the things that I think people in general have to understand is what a scam uh, medical insurance has been, you know, and what it was put out there. Um, one thing that, um, you know, I, I came across it, uh, somebody had told me about um, is like when Medicare and Social Security were set up, they set up 65 as the age to use. And the reason for that was, and you can Google this, what was the life expectancy of males, because they didn't care as much about the women, um, in 1963 when they were writing the bill? And the answer is right there at 66. So the idea is we collect money throughout the entire time while people are working, and then uh, we don't have to pay it back much because it won't be alive for much longer. Um, but that was a poorly skewed statistic. So anybody that is... Um, you know, into statistics, although you need to get rid of the outliers. And if your life expectancy is calculated by just taking all the birth dates and all the death dates, well, there's a lot of people who were dying at birth or within the first year, you know, and if you took out for those, um, you know, then people were actually living a lot longer than you think. And when I have scribes working for me, one of the things that um, we did was a little um, exercise where you look up your favorite historical figure and what age they were when they died. Mm. And the vast majority were well over 65, you know? And so, you know, a lot of those things now, the life expectancy has changed because of the development of vaccines and the fact that SIDS rates are very, very low now, you know, so it's very rare to have a child die. Um, and so a lot of this, you know, social security and Medicare were almost insolvent from the day they were started. And insurances, their main job is to not pay the bill. They have, you know, board meetings and, and strategies of how to minimize the amount that's going out, you know. 
Um, and this collaborative effort to make things better is going to have to go beyond that as far as a financial approach. And I like your outlook on what does it take to make a patient-centered approach? And that's what's most appropriate. That's what we need to get back to. Um, and we have to, I, I know it's callous to say, take finances aside from that, but it cannot be the primary motivator if we want to have anything quality. Yeah. Um, again, well said. Uh, Dana Coles, thank you for joining me. I appreciate you sharing. Uh, I appreciate you giving us your perspective on healthcare. Thanks my for listening to Perspectives on Healthcare. Visit PerspectivesOnHealthcare.com to learn more about Rob Oliver or to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If this podcast was valuable, we'd appreciate a review on iTunes. Or if you tell a friend or coworker about the show, that would be helpful too. Join us again next time for more Perspectives on Healthcare.